So first of all, let's figure out what we mean by stereotactic body radiotherapy or stereotactic uh, hypofractionated dosage, if you like. Uh, really, hypofractionated radiotherapy is a descendant of stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, and you'll hear more about that from my colleague uh, later this week or next week at the University of Chicago, uh, Dr. Yeniche, Kamil Yeniche. I'm focusing more on, on stereotactic body radiotherapy today. But nonetheless, this the procedure, um, SRS or stereotactic procedure, is a procedure in which the target is localized relative to a known three dimensional reference system. So SRS and SBRT or ablative therapy, really. That's really what these, these therapies are. It's a very high dose of radiation in a small number of fractions. So you're trying to ablate the tumor, right, is another way to describe it. So these are delivered using high doses of radiation, generally greater than 10 gray over a very short treatment course, less than five fractions. SRS is traditionally defined in a single treatment, the brain or spine, while SBRT is defined in treatment delivery elsewhere in the body. Uh, SRS typically is for brain. Um, spine can be extracranial, um, considered extracranial also. But there's a nice report from Dr. Solberg uh, in Practical Radiation Oncology that, that talks about some of these issues. All right, why do we worry about this? Well, the uptake of this technology has become significant. So there's, if you look back in the literature in 2011, there's an article published, which was a survey of SBRT utilization in the United States. They looked at, they surveyed 1,600 radiation oncologists and they got greater than 500 responses. And here's the uptakes uh, of this technology. So you can see almost an exponential growth from 2005, actually 2000, 2005, 20%, 2010, 65%. And if you look at now, which is 2018, we're probably close to the 90% mark, okay? And um, let's look at how this was further subdivided in this report. So lung is 90%, spine about 70%, liver 55%, and then all of these other sites. And you're starting to see much greater uptake uh, with some of these other sites like prostate, adrenal, pancreas, and even breast now. Now, we're not doing 10 gray fractions with breast, clearly, but breast is hypofractionated. We're doing 2.75 uh, fractions and still, you know, in 15 fractions. So you're getting closer to the 5 to 10 fraction threshold. So you can see that this technology is becoming significant and is becoming rapidly taken up in clinics in the United States and in the rest of the world, right? So uh, <clears throat> along with this technology, stereotactic radiosurgery and SBRT comes the, the whole issue of complexity, okay? And why do we say it's complex? Well, there are complex interactions between different factors which confound the ability, ability to image and target accurately, meaning it just makes it difficult to image and target accurately. There's a small number of fractions, which means that the setup and certain these cannot average out as with conventional treatment over many fractions. Okay, so this means that, you know, if you're doing three fractions of 18 gray, you don't have much opportunity to make a mistake, or even if you're doing a single fraction, right? You, whereas if you're doing, you know, 30 or 40 fractions, if there's a small error made in one fraction, that can be made up in other fractions. So this is an important consideration. You're giving very high doses, which means you must hit the target and avoid normal tissues, right? Very important. You don't have a lot of opportunity to fix this problem if mistakes happen. And then you're dealing with small fields. Uh, with stereotactic procedure, you, you're generally down to about five millimeters, the SBRT you're generally less than five CM. So small field physics is involved and it's quite complicated. All of this means that the beam model, the target, the dosimetry and target localization must all be very highly accurate. Again, there's no room for error. So why do we 
think that there's a possibility of room for error? Or why do we worry about complexity? Well, because mistakes have happened, and many mistakes have happened in the context of SBRT and SRS. Um, they've happened throughout the world, in Europe, in the United States, and I'll share with you a few examples. So this was an accident, and this is a very nice article which you can get, it's freely available online, uh, that was published by the, by the team in France where these accidents were observed. So they were trying to be transparent and help the community, and they published the accidents that occurred. So in one particular example from this paper, the error impacted 145 patients uh, treated for brain tumors using a 6MV beam with a micro MLC. The error was due to inaccurate measurement of small field output factors. So what they did was they used a farmer type cylindrical ion chamber with an air cavity of 0.65 cc's, internal diameter of six millimeters and length of 23 millimeters. So hopefully you all are shaking your head saying you would never do that, right? Certainly you do not want to do that. You, if you use such a large volume chamber, you will suffer from significant volume averaging effects and significantly underestimate the output factor. So if your output factor is supposed to be 0.8, let's say, and you measure it at 0.4, that means the dose that you're going to give the monotenous is twice, right? So in this particular example, the monotenous, the overestimation was indeed about a factor of two. The maximum overdosage was 200%. So here's um, what happened here. The output factor should have been measured with a small volume ion chamber. Instead, it was measured with a large volume ion chamber. You can see the triangles is the large volume ion chamber. And the correct numbers were the small volume. So if you took, for example, uh, 10 millimeter, 1 cm square field, the number was supposed to be 0.8, it was around 0.4, okay? So the correct volume ion chamber is a 0.03 pinpoint chamber, which you would always use. You would use either a small, uh, small ion chamber, a pinpoint ion chamber, stereotactic ion chamber, or a, a diode, or uh, you know something very small to measure these output factors. Well, these, we're not immune from this, certainly in the U.S., and there have been several mistakes that have happened in the U.S. as well. And in one in a hospital in Missouri, where the error, error impacted 76 patients undergoing stereotactic radio surgery, these patients were overdosed by 50% after miscalibration of the equipment and routine checks over five years, okay, five years failed to catch the error. They actually had an independent check and when they realized that this mistake happened. Again, it was due to an incorrect volume to measure the small field output factors. So uh, clearly, you know, of course, as well, you know, this, this article was from the New York Times. You may be familiar with the accidents that happened in, in the New York Times articles, but, you know, this is, uh, I, I can't speak uh, more uh, openly and, and, and um, uh, emphasized the importance of small field dosimetry when you're doing stereotactic body radiotherapy procedures. So this is a nice example from a colleague of mine, friend of mine, Dr. Tim Solberg at UCSF, um, the University of California in San Francisco. So he shared this with me. It was a survey of 40 identical linear accelerators, and they were measuring the output factor for a six millimeter ML field defined by the MLC. So if you were to look at this, you would say, well, you know, hopefully you would say, you know, the variation that you may see in your centers, if you all measured at different clinics on the same machine, these output factors for a six millimeter field, you might say, well, you'd expect a 10%, 10, 15% variation maybe, right? Well, look and see what kind of variation they found. They found a 45% variation. And with some numbers that were ridiculously low, like 0.45 and you know, 0.1 and things like that, you know, numbers that you just wouldn't expect to see. So given the fact that all of these physicists, which I'm assuming are trained physicists working on these systems, to come up with a 45% variation tells you about the problem that we have with regard to the small field output factors. 
Um, so again, I just, these slides are mainly just to kind of open your eyes with regard to the importance of small field asymmetry in the context of SBRT. So let's look more in detail at, at why we, we are uh, encountering such issues with small field dosimetry. So there's a couple of good articles on this um, by Doss and colleagues in medical physics. The IPEM report, which is the Institute of Physics and Engineering and Medicine, opened up our APM in the US. And uh, more recently, the TRS report, the technical report series from the IAEA, entitled Dosimetry of Small Static Fields Used in External Beam Radiotherapy, which is a very, an excellent report, and I highly encourage you to read it and to incorporate practices from this report in your clinics. So let's look at the definition of what is considered small from the IAEA report. At least one of the three physical conditions must be fulfilled. Any one of these three, if you have encountered this, then you would be in a situation of small field dosimetry. One, there's a loss of lateral charge particle equilibrium on the beam axis. Two, there's a partial occlusion of the primary photon source by the collimating devices. Or three, the size of the detector is similar or large compared to the beam dimensions. If you have any one of these, then you're in a small field condition. All right, let's look at occlusion of the photon source. On the left, you see um, a relatively large field. So you're, if you're at the location of the, of the patient or the phantom looking up, you indeed can see the entire source, right? So in this particular case, you have a nice uh, profile here that's not in, impacted by source occlusion. On the right, however, if you look up from the, the location of the patient, what you see is you don't see the entire source, right? So you see part of the source. So what that means is the source is occluded. There's an eclipsing in this region of the source. So now if you think about the output of the linear accelerator as being an integration or summation of the fluence across the entire line here, right? Which it is, right? The output is defined by the, the integration or summation of photons along this line. And if you are only seeing part of the source, then it makes sense that you would have a reduction in the output factor, which is what you see here, because the output is defined by the fact that you're seeing the entire source. If you're not seeing the entire source, then you would be occluded. So this is an important consideration. So there's some Nice work that was done by my friend, Alan Nahum at the Clatterbridge Cancer Center in the UK, where they looked at Monte Carlo simulations. And what, in the Monte Carlo simulations, they scored karma instead of dose. Why did they score karma? Because remember, karma is a kinetic energy released in material, right? The energy that's given from the photon to the electron, and when the electron absorbs the energy, it stops. So you're not tracking the electron. In other words, you're only tracking photons. The electrons deposit all of their energy locally, so you're not dealing with the charge particle equilibrium problem. You're only looking at the photon source problem. And so what do you see? Well, if you do the simulation assuming a point source, you see the behavior in this dashed line. So you see some reduction, but it's not significant. However, if you use the full source, which is a line, it's a Gaussian distributed line source, what you see is that around seven millimeters, you start to see a rapid reduction in the output factor. And this reduction in the output factor is indeed due to the eclipsing of the source. Okay, so um, that's an interesting finding. Anyway, so, you may wonder, what, what, what does this have to do with my planning system? Well, it does have a lot to do with uh, current traditional planning systems. An example is the uh, Eclipse, the, the anisotropic, uh, analytic anisotropic algorithm, AAA, and Acuros. We've done some comparisons with the uh, inside the treatment planning system model, the stereotactic model. And on the left, we see the AAA, uh, profiles now for a very small field size, 0.5 centimeter field size for different source widths. Okay, 
So if you start at zero millimeters, you see it's the top line, and then as you increase, and um, you see it, it reduces here because you're, you're eclipsing, right, at a three millimeter source. And if you compare it to the Monte Carlo calculations, you can see the Monte Carlo calculations fall right between one and two millimeters, right around a millimeter and a half. Well, why is that? Because the source, physical source, is indeed around 1.5 millimeters, right? So you can see that even in your own planning systems, this is an important consideration. And the same thing shows for, is shown for the Acuros calculation where um, as you start from zero up to three millimeters, you have this discrepancy and Monte Carlo is right falling right between one and two millimeters. All right, let's talk about treatment planning for SBRT. Um, and this is focused again now on extracranial sites like liver, lung, spine, and so on. In general, there, here are some best practices. Uh, to get the best dose distributions because one of the goals here is to get a very sharp fall off. So you want to use non-overlapping beams and non-coplanar beams if possible and if it helps you to increase your dose fall off. Okay, so this is an example of a seven field long non-coplanar plan. Choose, always choose the beams with the best geometry for the particular site. So for instance, if you have a tumor that's located on the right side uh, of the lung peripherally, you don't want to put a lot of beams through the contralateral uh, lung, right? You, you don't need beams from the left side of the patient. You know, if it's, if it's seated on one side of the patient, then try to focus the, the radiation on that side so that you can avoid normal tissues such as the normal lung tissue. That's just a common sense thing. And the same thing would apply for a liver or a pancreas. Here are some dose distributions. Um, you have a seven field liver, a seven field lung here, eight field pancreas, eight field vertebral body spine. Notice the one thing that you see here in all of these cases, and, and this is a very important consideration. It's critical for SBRT planning. And that is you want to use as many beams as possible. So typically you don't want to use less than seven fields. Okay, and, and there's an important reason for that. And that has to do with acute skin toxicity. This was an actual publication in the Red Journal back in 2008. You can certainly reference it. But this is the kind of toxicity that you will see if you use too few beams. I think there were only two or three beams being used in this particular technique um, with very high doses. And as a result, if you don't spread out the dose into the skin with many beams, you can end up with this kind of really adverse toxicity to the patient. Uh, so it's an important consideration. All right, what about uh, margins, block margins for SBRT plans? Okay, so you, you, you don't necessarily always want to use IMRT uh, for, for treatment plans because with IMRT, you have motion issues and interplay issues and so on. So, you know, oftentimes you might be using 3D techniques. Well, with 3D techniques, you do have to worry about the margin between the PTV and the MLC, right? Called the block margin. So this is a nice paper from Brian Kavanaugh and colleagues where they showed what happens if you use, if you generate a treatment plan with zero millimeter block margin and with one CM block margin. So if you if you bring the, the collimator or the MLC right to the edge of the PTV, you see this very non-uniform dose to the, to the PTV, right? Where you have, um, you know, a 60% half plot, right? You, you see this increase from 100% up to 60%. But if you use a traditional margin, 1CM margin, then you see a nice uniform dose to the target. But look at the normal tissue. So with the zero millimeter margin plan, you have a very sharp fall off to the normal tissue also. Um, and then here's the 1CM plan, which is much larger to the normal tissue. So what happens then basically is that if you bring this down to a zero millimeter margin, you are getting a much higher hotspot in the target, up to 60% in this case, and you're getting a steeper dose fall off in the lung. And they show here some calculations where they computed the lung NTCP. So if you're using a margin of 10 millimeters, it's 46%. 
when you're down to two and a half or zero millimeters, it's down to you know, five to 10%. So you're driving up the dose in the target and you're reducing the dose in the normal tissue. Why do you want to do that for SDRT? We want to do it for SDRT because a lot of the excellent outcomes that we see with SDRT, as in the case of early stage lung cancer treated with SDRT, is because, is potentially, I should say, because we are driving up the dose in the GTV, right? So it could be, you know, radiobiologically speaking, that if you give these very hot doses inside the GTV, you know, 20, 30% or even higher, that that effect could be driving the excellent outcomes. So let me just show you a picture here. PTV, and here's the block margin that I was talking about. This is the conventional block margin, you know, five to six millimeters. And the reason for this is that you want to account for the beam penumbra. You know, with conventional treatment planning, so two grade per fraction, you generally want to keep your maximum dose within 10%. For SBRT, you don't want to do that. You want to do the opposite. You want to drive up the dose in the target, as we just discussed. And so you bring your block margin in uh, to zero or even negative sometimes. Uh, this will give you a faster do dose follow up outside the P PTV and will raise your dose within the target to greater than 25%. They, they generally say that the hotter it is, the better. All right, so what are other, some, uh, some other planning considerations? Uh, this, this is coming from the protocols, uh, the RTOG 0813 and 0915, which are excellent protocols and are available online. And I would highly encourage you to, if you're not already doing this, to incorporate these protocols into your practice. So they talk about uh, the maximum dose uh, normalized to the 100% must be within the PTD. Prescription dose must be greater than 60% and less than 90% of the maximum dose. Um, so you want it to be hot in the target. Uh, talks about pre prescription isodose service coverage, high dose spillage, cumulative volume of all tissue outside the PTV receiving a dose of greater than 105% should be no more than 15% of PTV volume and intermediate dose spillage and other things. Um, here are some of the normal tissue constraints from uh, RTG 0618, 0813, 0915, and task group, APM task group report number 101. You can see some of them here. V20 uh, in the five fraction, you want to limit to less than 10%. In three fraction, less than 10%. Uh, liver, max mean, esophagus, heart, spinal cord, etc. So this kind of gives you a conversion in the normalized tissue, uh, target dose or you know, BED, biologically equivalent dose, uh, how to convert between different fractionation schemes. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about spine. And you know, you worry about uh, conformity indices and in dealing with spine and gradient indices. Conformity indices is the ratio of the prescription volume to the planning target volume. Uh, value of greater than one means that this planning uh, prescription isodose volume is too large, potentially over treating the normal tissues. If it's less than one, it's too small, potentially under treating the normal tissues. So, these are some of the considerations. This is from for spine SDRT from RTOG 0631. And um, so just showing some conventions of how you consider the uh, spinal cord and the partial spinal cord. But you can see that one of the important constraints is here is that you want the volume of uh, less than or, or equal to 0.35 cc getting no more than 10 gray, right? And at less than or equal to 10% of the partial spinal cord gets no more than 10 gray. So these are the kinds of things that we have incorporated in our practice, which are important for spine as well. And then one other one, which is less than uh, or equal to 0.03 cc, a maximum of 14 gray. So again, these kinds of constraints and this advice that you get from the protocols are very helpful in ensuring safety of your planning practice. Okay, if you follow those guidelines or, or adhere closely to them, you can be sure you're not going to harm the patient. All right, so what about small field? If you're doing lung SDRT, what, what else do you have to consider? Well, you do have to worry about the dose algorithm. 
And the AAPM test group 101 says you should be using a convolution type algorithm or convolution superposition algorithm uh, or a Monte Carlo algorithm or something like, like AAA or Acuros. You do definitely not want to use pencil beam algorithms. And here's the reason. So what happens is you have this problem of scattering of electrons in low density tissue, which carries energy away. Here's what I'm trying to get at there. Um, so this is a, a Monte Carlo simulation on a slab phantom. This is water, lung, lung tissue and water. And uh, so you can see when the electrons hit the lung tissue because of the large range, they start scattering outwards. So this concept of lateral charged particle comes into play. So if you had a tumor here inside the lung, then the energy that would normally be deposited in the lung is deposited in, in the lung tissue that would be normally deposited in the tumor rather is carried away into the normal lung. And so you end up with an underdosage in this tumor. So here is an example of that. So this is a, a patient that we, we, we looked at a couple different algorithms, a pencil beam algorithm. Um, the diameter was small, three centimeters, volume 15 cc. If you do a pencil beam calculation, you see it looks great, right? You have your PTV, you're doing a great job covering the PTV at 95%. Now, if you recompute this with the Monte Carlo algorithm in the same planning system, here's what you see. So you see it's significant underdosage significant under dosage. So even 80% now is barely covering your GTV, let alone your PTV. And if you look at the DVH, you see a huge difference here. It's about a 40% difference in, in the minimum dose because this effect starts off on the edge of the tumor and works inward. Um, uh, you, you end up stopping electrons further in. You have sort of a build up region at the edge of the tumor again which causes this big effect. As you get closer to the center of the tumor, you get closer to the prescription dose. But again, the smaller the tumor, the worse this effect is, right? Uh, especially if you're using a pencil beam algorithm. With regard to normal lung tissue, the Monte Carlo predicts a greater low dose spread in the normal lung. Again, this is consistent with the idea that the normal lung tissue doses, electrons are spraying energy outward. And so you have this effect where you end up with a greater low dose spread. So you might ask how the other algorithms compete against pencil beam algorithms. We wrote a paper in the Green Journal in 2013 comparing different algorithms. And you can see that the, in general, the Monte Carlo collapsed cone convolution, AAA, were all in very good agreement, but they differed significant, significantly from the pencil beam algorithm, equivalent path like 1D or 3D algorithm. And here's a, a, an inset uh, magnified view of the uh, dose distribution. These patients were given 48 gray in four fractions, so 12 gray per fraction, 48 gray. And if you plan them with the equivalent path length 1D or 3D, you can see they predicted more like 50 gray or the prescription dose. We're, we're giving 48 gray to 95%. So the, the, the point dose was, was 50 point something. So you can see that they're predicting 50. Here's the 3D, which predicts, you know, within a few percent of the 1D algorithm. But you can see the other algorithms are significantly different, you know, on the order of 10, you know, 15, 20% different maybe. And the other algorithms, which include collapsed tone convolution, Monte Carlo, Acuros, AAA, are all generally in good agreement. All right, so we, we, we spent some time talking about uh, treatment planning, some of the considerations, some of the, the normal tissue doses, the tissue heterogeneity problem. What about delivery? You know, how can we ensure that we're getting the delivery right? So this, my son likes transforming. So I put this picture in. So this is like, you know, trying to hit a fly with this uh, sword on the transformer, right? Um, it can be, especially if you're dealing with motion. So here are some of the machines that I'll, I'll, I'll share with you that we use to treat um, with IGRT-based systems. So, you know, things like the tomotherapy, the varying electric system, 
the Vero, the, the uh, AccuRay system, and uh, the ViewRay, uh, more recently the Electra system and so on. All right, so uh, I mentioned that, um, you know, there are accidents that are important uh, in the context of radio surgery. Here's another example in the context specifically of SRS that I wanted to share with you. This was another nice example from this paper in uh, radiation protection dosimetry from the folks in France. So this patient was treated for an uh, AVM, arterial venous malformation with SRS fraction 6MV with comb collimator. Backup collimators, as you know, are needed to block the radiation outside the comb system. The collimators should have been set to 40 by 40 millimeters. Instead, they were set to 40 by 40 centimeters. Okay, so you can imagine the impact that had on the patient. Now, we had a similar issue in, in the US that was published in the New York Times where same thing happened on the left. You see that in the proper collimation system, the backup jaws are coming to the edge of the collimator to block the radiation. The particular accident that happened, the backup jaws were open too big. In this particular case, what happened was there was a miscommunication between the therapist and the physicist. The physicist said to the therapist, set the backup jaws to 10 by 10. They assumed it was 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. The physicist was referring to 10 millimeters. Okay. And this is what happened. And, and this led to some significant changes in the policies and procedures in many states in the U.S. In fact, after the, this incident, they required that the vendor put in a hard interlock in, within their system for any state in which they were treating. So the, uh, Texas was an example where they put in a law that said you are not allowed to treat with this system unless the vendor puts in an interlock to prevent this from happening. So, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that we've had to have accidents like this to make changes, but uh, fortunately, uh, you know, we are making some changes with regard to this kind of thing. So there are uh, many different approaches for managing motion, and this is a nice slide from my friend, Dr. Kesson. Um, on the left, you see a conventional or ITV-based motion envelope approach. In the, in the second one, you see the gating approach where the target is treated only when you're in the gating window. Then you see the breath hold approach, right, where you're actually treating in breath hold. And then finally, you see the tracking approach where you're actually moving the source or the MLCs to actually track the target. So we'll kind of go through some of these. Beginning with the ITV based approach, which is the motion envelope. And so this gives you flexibility, but you might have a problem. So let's say this is your motion envelope at time of simulation. Then you, at time of treatment, when you image, you might have a systematic shift. You might have a different motion envelope. And so what do you do about that? Well, you have to account for that and you have to potentially reposition the patient or you potentially have to resim the patient if the patient is not aligning up. So we know that now conventional ITV-based localization has improved significantly since the introduction of cone beam CT by David Jaffrey in 2005, right? And uh, CBCT, Volumetric imaging has significantly improved positioning and, re and reduces required target margins and normal tissue growth. Here's how it works. As you know, you see um, your simulation target, and then at, at treatment day, you might see something different. Well, uh, if you have the volumetric information, you can very nicely align these, these envelopes and get a much better localization. So we've done some work where we showed in the context of early stage lung cancer for 150 patients, that uh, the margins, if you, if, if you set up localization based on skin tattoos, right? If you line the lasers to the skin tattoos, the margins are quite large, greater than 10 millimeters up to 12 millimeters in different, these are in the different directions for different tumors located in different areas like upper peripheral, lower peripheral, lung, and so on. Uh, but if you use CBCT image guidance with soft tissue alignment, you can see your margins are generally three to four millimeter in all of the different directions. So there are many publications showing the benefit. What about 4D comb beam CT? 
So you know that you can acquire chromium CT. It's generally 3D, but you now have the ability to do 4D. And here's just showing a picture from a nice article from Jan Jakob Sanke in, uh, in the Netherlands. So this is 3D chrome beam. This is 4D chromium CT at the peak inhale phase. And this is 4D chromium CT at the peak exhale phase. So you see a big difference going back, see, inhale, exhale. You can see that the inhale, exhale position rather, agrees much better with the 3D chromium CT because much of the respiratory cycle um, occurs at exhale. So 70% of the cycles at exhale. All right, so some considerations with regard to ITD-based volumetric imaging. Volumetric Im information is available to correct for systematic uncertainties. One is able to view normal tissues, which is very important. Uh, imaging information is static and not dynamic. One cannot account for real-time motion. Treatment imaging of the ITD may result in unwanted dose to the normal tissues, especially for high amplitude motion. So the point there being is if your motion envelope is very large, then you're also giving a fair amount of dose to normal tissue. The alignment of the CDCT, the reference planning CT data set, um, depends on which data set, right? You're aligning to, it could be the free breathing, could be the average, you have some differences there. That's where 4D combium CT may be helpful in a prospective setting. Uh, image noise and artifacts can confound proper visualization, especially where patient scatter is significant. This is especially an issue for KV cone beam CT, right? If you have um, a region like the pelvis where you have uh, a lot of anatomy and you have attenuation of the beam, then you have, have a lot of patient scatter, which degrades, as you know, the contrast, the su subject contrast or the soft tissue contrast with KV uh, because you are in the photoelectric, you know, half Compton, half photoelectric range. Whereas MV, you're in a Compton range, so it doesn't really matter much. Uh, but image noise is a problem for KV chromium CT. Artifacts, high Z artifacts, so metal implants are a problem, and you need to use some sort of metal artifact reduction. But it can be very problematic when you're trying to localize if you have these artifacts of noise. So what are some of the other approaches? Well, there's the ITV uh, 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 or alternative approaches to the ITV approach. One is called Brethold approach, the active breathing control device. So investigators have found that it is able to reduce margins by half or more for liver and lung tumors. Um, interfraction reproducibility is quite good within one to two millimeters. Um, for long, long-term interfraction reproducibility was, was, was not as good. Two to three millimeters up to you know, nine millimeters uh, in AV directions were observed in one study. And with the ABC, device, you are increasing the treatment time by a factor of three, three to five. There's also patient toler tolerability issues. So for instance, we find our lung patients have a very difficult time holding their breath. Uh, this might be more um, apt for tumors in the liver where t patients may be able to hold their breath. There's other approaches like use of uh, gating blocks or external surrogates. With the external surrogate, there can be phase shifts between the internal position, so in this case, between the diaphragm position and the marker position. There's a phase shift here because these positions occur at different times, right? So as a result, you have to account for that. There's the ability to be, use implanted fiducial markers. So this is the real-time tumor tracking system from the folks in Japan, four X-ray tubes and four image intensifiers. Uh, temporal resolution is excellent, 30 frames per second, and precision is 1.5 millimeter, 40 millimeters per second. One of the problems is with, is with this system is that you're implanting the device, the fiducials, which can be, obviously, can be invasive. The other issue is that you're requiring real-time fluoroscopic imaging, so you can have very high skin doses, uh, which can be problematic for the patient. There are other systems that incorporate optical guidance, the exact track brain lab system, the uh, optical image system, uh, where you're using stereoscopic x-rays to glean 3D information about the imaging. Uh, but of course, this information is based on bony landmarks. But 
you get the picture here with this optic system and infrared cameras, you can then uh, gate the radiation and you can see on the left here, um, the amount of normal tissue that you're sparing when you turn the radiation beam on at a certain point only. This, uh, the cyber knife system, which is the uh, robot system. This is a 6MV Linac integrated KV imaging marker or bony, uh, marker or bony match. The tumor position can be correlated with the internal or external surrogates with an adaptive model. The model is updated. This is limited to beams in the AP hemisphere. And again, it's a bit limited because you're using surrogates that are bony landmarks. Unless you have direct markers in the tumor, you're often using surrogates that are not as good um, uh, representing the actual tumor motion. There's the, uh, the tumor tracking or moving MLC system that was published by Paul Keel, where they combine this with the Calypso electromagnetic guided MLC. So this feedback between the Calypso system, the implanted markers and motion of the MLC. Um, there are other Linac based technologies, uh, the Varian, uh, True Beam Edge, the Versa HD system. These generally have the following features. Onboard KV, comb beam CT, 4D comb beam CT, real-time MV, epic imaging, high-definition multi-leaf collimators, intrafraction triggered imaging, surface, they can often come with surface-based or even ultrasound-based tracking, um, and implanted marker tracking, and, and here, real-time ultrasound. Here's a picture of a real-time surface-based monitoring system, the Vision RT or the OSMS system that's uh, currently coupled with the, with the variant True Beam or Edge. And the idea here is that you're picking a region of interest on the patient and you're using optical cameras to monitor that region of interest. And you can see in this case in the region of the uh, lower thorax that this region of interest is tracking the respiratory motion. So, it's not as great for tracking things like respiratory motion or, or being a good surrogate of the tumor, but what it does help you with significantly is motion of the patient. So if you're trying to set up a patient that's been on the table for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you're worried about movement when the patient has some discomfort. This system is excellent for picking up any type of motion like that. And you put in tolerances and you connect it to the Linux so that when you exceed your tolerance, the Linux shuts off automatically. So in this case, the tolerance is exceeded. The 2.8 degree or the 0.64, it was supposed to be 0.5. If it's above that, then it, then it stops the bleed. There are ultrasound based systems, uh, real time ultrasound system from uh, Electa that I mentioned. So this system is pushed up against the patient's perineum and you're basically monitoring the prostate motion in real time. So again, you can set a uh, threshold for the motion. And if your motion is outside five millimeters, let's say, then the beam can shut off automatically. So some considerations with regard to respiratory gating and tracking. It can reduce normal tissue exposure, especially for tumors moving with large amplitudes. The gating increases the treatment time considerably, two to five times, depending on the patient, on the duty cycle and the patient compliance. Implanting fiducials can be invasive. Important one here, with gating, residual motion can behave unpredictably and could exceed planning markers. Uh, and so the recommendation from a paper by Mark Murphy back in 2002 was that daily image guidance should be performed and that volumetric image information is helpful. So here's a, um, an example from this paper by Martin Murphy uh, showing correlation between the internal position of the tumor from the internal marker and the external uh, surrogate. So here's a, a AP view of the internal fiducial, which looks like this, but look at the external fiducial. There's no correlation at all here between the two, suggesting that you have to be careful with this when you're using external markers to predict tumor motion or you have to be, at least be able to incorporate this into your margin design. This is a nice example from David Jeffrey, which talks about um, 
hitting the target and avoiding organs at risk. So he shared with me this example. There's a patient they treated at Princess Margaret. Um, here's the planning CT. This was a long SDRT treatment. And here's the onboard CT and the same slice, the central axis slice. So what they did was they scrolled through the cone beam CT and they found that, hmm, this looked okay, that looked okay, but here you saw some behavior changes. You see that the heart now is starting to fall much more inside of the uh, high dose region, okay? So using this information online, they were able to re uh, reset up the, the patient so to move this heart. You can see a fair amount of the high dose region now is moved out right, on this high dose region to the low dose region, just based on looking at the volumetric information, right? Right, with a planar x-ray, you're, you're looking at the central slice, but with Colby CT, you can look at the, uh, the rest of the volume. So the point here is that the target and surrounding normal tissues don't necessarily move together. So in other words, seeing the normal tissues may be as important as seeing the target. So if you're just worried about the target and you're not concerned about what's going around the target, uh, happening you know, around the target, that could be problematic because they don't have to move together. And this is a nice example of demonstrating that point and speaking to the value of volume-based imaging. All right, so I will chat with you a bit now about the next, the next phase in, in our movement in IGRT towards... Um, um, towards being able to see the target and really hitting the target while avoiding normal tissues. And this had to do with MRI. This is uh, some early pictures from the MRI system from Electa. So you see much superior soft tissue contrast here. These are some images from the V-Ray system for a breast patient. So here on the left showing the, uh, this is a 0.35 Tesla system showing the lumpectomy cavity. On the right, showing a comparison with Combi CT. We installed uh, the first in the world U-Ray Linux system uh, in 2017. And I can tell you that what you see is almost miraculous sometimes with patients with regard to the motion during treatment. Uh, let me share with you a case study from some of the work that we've, uh, we, we've done. So this was a, uh, about a 70 year old female with a recurrent small cell lung cancer and soft tissue lesion measuring about two and a half by four centimeters and causing pain and right side block, blockage of the, the urinary uh, of the kidney function. So uh, there was a stent that was put in to uh, relieve this blockage of kidney. And so the target organs at risk were defined. The patient was, was slated for 27 grain three fractions. And I should point out that the physician in looking, making this decision was not comfortable treating this patient on any other technology uh, because they really wanted to be sure that they could see the target in normal, normal tissues because with a dose of, uh, with, with the dose as high as nine times three, you can't take a chance. So this is kind of what, um, what you see with this patient. You see the lesion and you can see the, um, so basically what happens with the system is that you define a region of interest. And if your motion exceeds this region here, then the radiation stops. So you treat only when, when, the, um, when your window is within this outline. And um, you, you would never be able to see the tumor uh, if you use an X-ray based technology. Uh, it's, it's, it's too problematic in terms of soft tissue contrast uh, with x-ray based systems to see this kind of level of detail. So you get the idea there. So the patient, we found that the patient's pain was significantly improved within a short period of time. There was no GI or GU toxicity. You can see the CT SIM, three month follow-up and, and five month follow-up. Um, and at, at follow-up, uh, there was complete, almost complete response with total restoration of renal function and around, allowing the stent to be removed. Uh, again, I, I noted this would not have been possible without real-time visualization of the target and dose-limiting normal tissues. So I, I want to share with you some initial results that was presented at Astro about this technology. 
to show that it's not just about developing cool technologies. At the end of the day, we want to show that we can bring some benefit to patients. So this was a retrospective review of 42 patients treated with uh, locally advanced or borderline receptive pancreatic cancer uh, at different institutions. This was this is data from uh, Dr. Rudra and Karik at WashU. And I should point out that since that time, about six months ago, Dr. Parikh joined us at Henry Ford Hospital. And he led this investigation. And so you can see that the, the dose scheme here and the fractionation number of patients, it's not a large number of patients. And also remember, it's a retrospective study, so it's not prospective. But nonetheless, the, the results are interesting. So you can see with conventional, you're giving 50.4 gray, hyperfractionated 50 to 67 gray, and then SDRT, and they categorize this according to BED less than 90 gray versus BED greater than 90 gray. Um, and I'm showing the numbers there. In the BED greater than 90 gray, 75% of fractions were adapted, meaning daily adaptation, meaning that the plan was changed every day online to account for the, the, the anatomy of the day. And if you look at the cohort less than 90 gray, only 4% were adapted. So here's the results of local control. So if you were able to give above 90 gray safely with daily adaptation, you saw a significant increase in local control. Again, remember now, this is pancreatic cancer, right? These patients generally have a six month survival. So you, you're seeing, whereas when they're not adaptive, less than 90 gray, you're less about 50, 55%, you're up to you know, close to 90% with local control. And then overall survival was about was also significantly different. At 25 months, you saw about 80% in the BED greater than 90, and less than 40% in BED less than 90. So the results were that the high dose uh, uh, MR, GRT greater than 90 almost doubled the overall survival. High dose patients had increased local control compared to standard dose as well. High dose patients with daily adaptation had less toxicity. In fact, there was no toxicity out of the 15 patients that were treated in, the, in this arm because, and the thinking there is that the adaptive um, aids in delivering higher BED treatments to, to the pancreatic while at the same time you're seeing the normal tissue so you can adapt to the normal tissue. So the prospective multi-institutional trial is currently underway. And we're using 10 times five. So this is five different institutions. And I'm happy to say we were the first institution to treat the first patient a few weeks ago on this, on this trial. And the goal is to really be able to try to help these patients. So summary, hyperfractionated treatment using SRS and SBRT or SABRE requires high levels of accuracy in patient simulation, planning, and treatment delivery. Localization accuracy is critical. The margin design must incorporate systematic and random errors, as well as other factors such as the strength of the surrogate used to image the tumor. Remember the Van Hoek formalism. Advances in technology uh, in planning and image guided RT have enabled us to offer very high BEDs to tumors safely, resulting in better outcomes for patients. Of course, you have to do this very carefully and safely. And you know, finally, technologies, in my view, should be driven by clinical problems. Clinical problems should not be driven by new technology. We shouldn't just be developing new technologies for fun. We should find a, a reason for developing clinical technologies with the patient in mind. In other words, we want to be able to help patients. And we have to evaluate these new technologies carefully with results from clinical trials used to derive efficacy and, and value to patients. So I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that helped me with these slides, and I would like to thank you for your attention.